Hello everybody. Do you work with massive sensor, image, simulation, statistics data? And do you need fast, flexible and interoperable services on them? In this case, the big geodata standards or the Open Geospatial Consortium are your friends. In these webinars, we will explore the web coverage service ecosystem through practical use cases that will help you familiarize yourself with the system. My name is Peter Baumann. I'm the editor of the OGC coverage standards. And my name is Alex Dumitru. I'm a core developer of Rasdaman, which is the reference implementation to the web cover service. All right, so let's jump into it. This is about the web coverage service, WCS, and in particular, the core of it. So the basic functionality that every WCS must support. What we will learn today is, what is the mission and use of WCS? What is it good for? What are the specific request types that WCS offers? And how does retrieval and encoding of coverages work in WCS? What you need to bring along is a little bit knowledge about HTTP and some XML, and in particular about the OGC coverage implementation schema. So what is an OGC coverage? If you feel insecure about the latter one, then you may just want to rewind and go to the webinar that we have done about coverages. Okay, so let's jump into it. Mission and use. We have never before seen such a wave of data pouring in on us because it's simply so easy and also so inexpensive to obtain such data. If we talk about coverages in sensor data, image or image time series or simulation output and statistics data, then we find a lot of variety and that can come either from natural observations, so sensor feeds, or it can come from simulations from artificially generated data sets. Regardless of what the origin is, we want to serve them in a homogeneous way to allow for simple retrieval and for a combination of data sets. So what would we want to do? Well, we might want to look at the data, so we want to see some visualization of it. We might want to mix in extra data. Or, on the other hand, on the other end, there is not a human, but there is a machine again. So in this case, we have machine-to-machine -machine communication and we need enough semantics behind so that those can talk uh, without human interference, without us holding hands. That's a particularly exciting issue and that is a particular feature also of WCS. Actually, the OGC set of standards helps very much to set up integrated landscape, integrated ecosystems of services. Upstream, we find the sensor observation service, which can understand virtually any sensor hardware and transform the output of a sensor into canonical representations, for example, into coverages. Once we have homogenized them, then the downstream services kick in and we find a lot of functionality in W something S services for download, for processing, for visualization. Starting with the WMS for visualization, the WCS for data retrieval, WCPS and WPS for data processing, etc. Actually, we find services along the line of the data structures. So we know about this classical triad of feature coverage and metadata, and for each of those we find services. A web feature service gives us features. A web coverage service allows us access to coverage data, and a catalog service allows search and retrieval on catalog on metadata. In between we have another animal, that is the web map service. This one is different. Number one, it understands features and coverages. So it's at the border between both. Number two, it returns images. That is exclusively for human consumption. Whereas with the other services, we get data that are ready for further processing in a GIS and some analytics tool like R, etc. So it's a particular property of those data services 
and WCS that we obtain data that are ready for further processing and, by the way, for WCS to retrieve data in a way that are unmodified so that we can be guaranteed that these are the original values that are provided by the service. Okay, so we've used the term coverage, and just as a brief refresher and warm-up, let's look into the coverage definition again. A coverage actually is a special kind of a feature, which is some geographic object, something that has a location. And in this case, actually, it's not something like vectors or polygons or so. It's actually something that uh, resembles sensor, image, simulation, and statistics data, as we have seen. So we would like to represent those as regular and irregular grids, as point clouds, or as meshes. And the whole thing is n-dimensional, from 1D sensors to 2D images, 3D image time series and voxel data, four-dimensional climate data sets, etc. So this is a coverage. And, as we know, those coverages tend to be big. So usually, actually, the big geodata indeed are coverages in GeoWorld. The definition of a coverage looks like that. Uh, coverage is derived from a feature and has three main components. The domain set tells us where we can find values. The range set are those values, so if you will, the pixel payload. And the range type in the middle, that defines the data structure of those range values of the pixel values so that we know what they actually mean. Additionally, a coverage has a hook for metadata. We'll come back on that later. This you will often find abbreviated as GMLCov. This specification actually document 09-146R2, which resembles this standard, has originally had the title of GML 3.2.1 Application Schema for Coverages. That is not only quite unwieldy and long, it's in particular misleading, as we have found out. So this is really a stupid name, actually, and therefore in 2015, OGC has decided to rename it to OGC Coverage Information Schema, or CIS, which is more adequate. So actually, this Coverage Information Schema represents an interoperable, testable, concrete way of defining data structures that can be shipped between services and to clients. And that is actually something that differentiates from ISO 19123, which has an abstract definition. This abstract definition allows a lot of different implementations and interoperable they become once they rely on the coverage information schema, the concrete one that is defined by OGC. So, that was about coverages. Now let's come to the service part of it. A web coverage service actually consists of modular parts. There is the core, which is mandatory. Every implementation must support that functionality, plus extensions. The core is tentatively kept very simple. It allows to give access to coverages, multidimensional coverages, and to subsets thereof. Because, as they are typically big data, we need to do some subsetting. That subsetting actually falls into two categories. It can be trimming or slicing. Trimming keeps the number of dimensions. So we can have a two-dimensional subset of a two-dimensional image, a three-dimensional subset from a three-dimensional time series data cube. Slicing, on the contrary, reduces the number of dimensions. So we can extract a two-dimensional lat-long slice, an image, from a time series data cube, or we can drill through vertically, so to say, and deliver a one-dimensional time series from such a time series data cube. Additionally, the web coverage service core can do a format encoding, depending on the format uh, encoding supported by the service. So that's all. That is WCS core. Everything else goes into extensions. Extensions are modular functionality facets that a vendor can choose to implement or not implement. And in the end, any tool, then any WCS implementation will be characterized by the number of extensions it implements and by the uh, choice of extensions. Now, sometimes people found this too much degree of freedom, they wanted to have some guidance. This is where application profiles come into play. They actually define some application, some domain-oriented bundling. So, for example, for Earth observation, 
there is an application profile that talks about two-dimensional gridded coverages and uh, time series thereof. MetOcean, on the other hand, is a um, draft that talks about four-dimensional climate data cube, cubes. And they all add specific uh, extensions that are necessary. For example, in Earth observation, you want to have CRS transformation and so on. So that is the overview of the suite. And now if we proceed further and drill down, we find that WCS core actually supports three request types. So over the web, you can send a get capabilities request. And what you get back is a capabilities document informing about the service qualities. You can send a describe coverage request that gives you a coverage description. Or you can send a get coverage request that is actually the central workhorse of WCS, which gives you a coverage back. Let's look at them in turn. So get capabilities, which allows you to obtain service information, could be requested like this. So you construct a URL in get KVP syntax. I've chosen this one because it's the simplest one for displaying on screen. Get KVP runs best on PowerPoint. Okay, we say that uh, our service is a WCS and we want to talk to some service that offers version 2.0. And the request finally is get capabilities. That's all. What we get back is a so-called capabilities document that describes on the one hand the service functionality, so what functional items, what extensions are supported, and number two, what data offerings does this service provide. This actually is quite configurable. It is defined in OWS common and every uh, W something S service in OGC follows the same schema that is just a little bit extended by WCS for the particular purpose of supporting coverages. Actually, I should mention that this is not mandatory. You don't need to send a get capabilities to initiate communication with a WCS. If you know that information from somewhere else, maybe from a catalog, then you can just jump ahead and use one of the next requests. Let's look at those. So, no, stop. First, we want to look into a capabilities document. This is copied from a real life document, but grossly simplified. So a lot of things have been kicked out so that we focus on the most important stuff. So this is my little WCS, as the title says, and it offers information about the service functionality. In the profile section, you find URLs identifying extensions. In OGC, you should know that every extension is identified by a URL, and so we know exactly what this service supports. Naturally, it supports coverages. Okay, we would expect that. And it also expects it uh, supports get KVP. So we know that this service can be addressed using get KVP. It does not support SOAP, for example. And by the way, the image format it knows is, well, just one in this case, image slash TIFF. This is the MIME type identifier for TIFF images. So this is what we can request. On the data side, we find coverage summaries. So for the coverages offered, we get the ID and we get some initial information. We know where it sits in space, so we have the coordinate reference system and we have the coordinates and the number of dimensions. So we know that here we find two dimensional coverages that are expressed in WGS84. Okay, so now we know what our service offers. Now we can ask for details. The next request is describe coverage, which allows us to obtain some detailed information about one or more particular coverages. The request is pretty much the same. We just have replaced the request parameter by describe coverage, and we have added the identifier of a coverage which we want to inquire. The result of such a request is a coverage description document. Uh, you can pretty much see this as a coverage without the pixel payload. So only the technical metadata, the domain set you get in the range type. So this is usually relatively small and you can get some detailed information about that particular coverage. This is still not that exciting, so let us proceed to the final one, get coverage. Okay. This is the central workhorse which does the work for us that is accessing coverages. 
Remember, trim and slice is what it supports, so both is expressed in the syntax. We again have the request parameter and the coverage ID, and then on this coverage, now we want to do subsetting. So we find the first and second parameter, which subsets along latitude and longitude axes. Along longitude, we want to have everything from position 100 to 120. So actually, we are cutting out an interval here, and that tells us it's trimming. So this is still longitude in the result. Latitude, we want to know something. We want to get the area between 50 and 60. And so actually, we have done a cutout that is some rectangle along latitude, lang uh, longitude and latitude. A long time, it's different. You will find here, first of all, a time parameter, not just a number, but we can conveniently use a date parameter. We find just one date parameter here, and that actually tells us, now this is a slicing. We have a slice point here, and so actually we slice away the time dimension, and the result will be two-dimensional and having only long and lat. So, this might resemble the case where we extract a particular time slice from an image time series. So we have seen that here we can do slicing and trimming in a request in the get coverage. Actually, we could leave out all the subset parameters and then we simply get the whole coverage back. So this is a very simple way of getting access. And you don't need to think a lot about it. For example, the result will be in the coordinate system as stored, the native CRS as it's called and you will get back the coverage in the native format as it is stored on the server. So, no format conversion. That guarantees, for example, that this will be unmodified and there are now no rounding errors, errors and no numerical instabilities. So, if we want to have another encoding, then we need to indicate that. So the encoding parameter, the format parameter, allows us to obtain a coverage in some particular encoding. We identify the format by way of the MIME type identifier. So in this case, where we want to have a geotiff, we say image slash tiff. Okay, where do we know? Uh, how do we know which format we can use? Well, first of all, it must be suitable. So if you have a four-dimensional climate data set, you will have a hard time squeezing that into a flat TIFF file. So the format must make sense. It must be possible to encode. Second, this format must be supported by the server. So how do we know that? Well, we look into the capabilities document, and it tells us which formats can be retrieved here. So you see that actually automatic negotiation is possible. A machine can ask for the format supported and can utilize that later on in a request. So far, so good. But now, some people come and say, wait a moment, TIFF, uh, I lose some information. I cannot transport all the complete coverage information. What can we do there? Well, we could use another format. That's the typical answer in practice. And we could use, for example, GML. GML is informationally complete. We can pack in everything that makes up a coverage. Nice, but unwieldy. So when it comes to large coverages, uh, GML is maybe the last format we want to take. Good. Um, so we need to make a mix. That is where the multi-part encoding comes in. This actually is a mix of the best of both worlds. It consists of two parts, which are grouped together following the MIME specification. And actually, this is something that you know very well from your email. Whenever you have an email with attachment, this is a multi-part message. Same here. The first part is a canonical GML header. You get the domain set, the range type, and you get the metadata. You do not get, however, the range set. So the pixel payload is not there. Instead, you will find a link that points to the second part in this multi-part document. And this now is a binary encoding using any format that is supported by the server. In the example here, we have requested a multi-part document by saying media type equals multi-part slash related. And we have requested the format for the second part to be application 
slash x dash netcdf, which is the MIME type for netcdf files. So you get back a um, two-part document, and there is many tools out there which allow you to separate that, and then you can have your metadata in a canonical way and the binary payload in the desired data format. So this allows you to obtain information in virtually any encoding that you would like to have. And there is a growing list of uh, encodings that are defined in OGC and also ISO has expressed interest in extending this list. So we can use any suitable format for that. Ah, let's come back to the metadata. Now this is something that has been mentioned before, that a coverage actually uh, can transport metadata. Let's look at that in detail. Actually, um, this can really be any kind of metadata in a literal sense as GML defines it. So any particular type, any particular structure. This can be stored and delivered alongside with a coverage. So any vanilla WCS has the obligation to deliver the metadata. It does not know, it does not understand its contents, but it delivers it. One example is EOWCS, where this is being used so that we can transfer EO metadata, like phenomenon time, result time, procedure, observed property, etc. That's all things that are not defined in WCS, which WCS does not know, but it will deliver it. This, of course, depends on the format again, so uh, multipart might be our friend in this case. Let me mention that is the only metadata that a WCS is obliged to consider. Some implementations like to add further tags because they say, well, in GML I can add a substitution group with further elements. Yes, but the WCS doesn't know about that. A particular implementation will not know it. And so chances are that your metadata will not get transferred. Therefore, whenever you want to know, uh, want to be sure that these metadata get along, get delivered by any WCS, use the metadata slot. Of course, uh, if you want to do some custom implementation where you don't care about interoperability on metadata, then you can add and modify the structure. So this is the plot about the WCS, in particular the core. Extensions we will address later. But let me mention already that this WCS version 2, which is the current one, has quite some maturity and it has seen and enjoyed quite some uptake. That includes, includes open source tools like Rasterman, WCS core reference implementation, but there are many more implementations for clients and servers available. And that also includes commercial products that also support, by way of client and server, WCS version 2. So actually there is a large landscape out there of WCS technology that can readily be used and that is interoperable. We have the conformance tests in OGC so that every implementation can validate and can demonstrate, yes, I am fulfilling this specification exactly. Also with respect to scalability, there has been a lot of uh, implementation work showing that. So there are offerings, databases of more than 130 terabytes hosting multidimensional data and in particular also time series data. And as for efficient processing, the Rasterman engine has successfully split single requests over more than 1,000 cloud nodes. So we have a specification that can be implemented in a scalable and high-performant manner indeed. Below you see a couple of screenshots of different services that all rely on WCS and um, work somewhere in the field of earth sciences, actually in different domains. So that's it about the theory. And now I would hand over to Alex to show us some hands-on work on these items. Now that we have seen the theoretical basis of the coverage model and the web cover service, let's try out some practical examples that will help you familiarize yourself with the concepts. In this session, we will be using this web interface to issue HTTP requests to the WCS endpoint. 
However, you can do this using any HTTP client that you like, for example, your browser or a command line tool like CURL. The full URL to the request will always be shown here in this input field. As you remember, there are three core WCS operations that you can use get capabilities, describe coverage, and get coverage. Let's try to issue a get capabilities request. We have the endpoint here at localhost. And let's add the parameters. The first one is the service parameter, and we will add WCS. The second one is the version of the service, and in our case it's 2.0.1. And the third one is the request parameter type, which in our case it's get capabilities. Now that we have constructed a full request, let's send the request and see what we get back. So we got back an XML document and let's examine it for a bit. The first section, service identification, tells us a bit about the endpoint. We have the title, the abstract, the service type and the service type version in these tags. We also have a list of OWS profiles that describe the functionality of the server. For example, this URL here tells us that the KVP protocol binding is available for this endpoint. This uh, URL here tells us that uh, the GeoTIFF encoding extension is enabled, so we can export uh, coverages in GeoTIFF format. And for example, this uh, URL here tells us that the range subsetting extension is enabled, so we can do range subsetting as well. A WCS client could use the information in this section to see what the service, the endpoint is capable of. The next section tells us a bit about the information, the contact point of the service provider. We get the provider name, the provider website and some uh, contact information like the name and uh, email address of the administrator of the endpoint. The next section, the operations metadata, tells us how to issue the request to the service. For example, we see that the get capabilities request can be done at, the, at this URL here. We also see that we can do this via post encoding as well, either using XML or SOAP format. We can do the same thing for describe coverage and get coverage, and we can do, can do it in the same way as get capabilities. The next section, the service metadata, contains the formats that are supported by this server. In this case, it's JPEG 2000, NetCDF, GeoTIFF, and of course, GML encoding of the coverage. We also see extra metadata information exposed by the extensions. For example, the interpolation extension lists here all the interpolation methods supported. In our case, it's only the nearest neighbor. Last section is the contents one that contains the most important information of the service, the coverages available here. For example, here we have the coverage ID with, uh, with the name C0001. We also know the type of the coverage, in this case it's a rectified grid coverage. And we also know the subtypes of the coverage. In this case, the rectified grid coverage is an abstract discrete coverage and an abstract coverage. So a WCS client that can handle abstract discrete coverages could also handle rectified grid coverages. So it would know how to display or how to process this coverage. So let's issue now a described coverage request. The service parameter stays the same and so does the version one, but the request parameter is changed to the described coverage string. We also have to tell the service which coverage we want to be described. So we will identify it by coverage ID and let's look in the capabilities document and find a suitable one, for example, C0001. Let's send the request and see what we get back. So we have here the metadata of the coverage encoded in an XML document. Let's examine each section again and let's start with the bounded by section that contains the geographical information and coordinates of the coverage. The envelope tag tells us that the CRS of this coverage is EPSG4326, that the axes are called LAT 
for latitude and long for longitude that we have some units of measure for each axis and the names uh, and the size of the dimensions. We also get the extent from minus 6.5 to 3.5 on latitude and 0 0.5 to 3.5 on longitude. We now get here in the coverage ID element the name of the coverage which is exactly the one that we requested. Then the domain set uh, element is listed which contains the rectified grid that is defined by the underlying raster and the list of offset vectors ordered in the same way as the grid axis. The offset vectors will connect the grid axis to the CRS axis and defines the resolution. So for example this offset vector tells us that each raster pixel has a sample space of 1 on the latitude axis. Next we get the section called range type that describes the structure of the data of the coverage. Uh, we get a list of fields back and for each field, which sometimes it's known as a channel or as a band, depending on your domain of interest. So for each field, we get uh, the description of the field and the name, in this case red and red channel, and the list of nil values, for example here 0 and 255, and the reasons for them being a nil value. So 255 is above detection range and 0 is below detection range. We also get the unit of measure code, uh, which represents uh, an identifier for the unit of measure. We get the same here for green, the green channel, and for blue, the blue channel, same information. Last section is the type of the coverage, in this case rectified grid coverage, and the subtypes that can be used to determine uh, if the client supports this kind of coverage. You also get the native format of the coverage, and in our case it's an application of TetStream. Other WCS services might choose to keep the coverage in a GOT format or directly in the GML format. Now that we have seen how to retrieve the metadata, let's see how to get the data as well. Let's issue a get coverage request for the same coverage and see what we get back. To achieve this, we only have to change the request type from describe coverage to get coverage. The coverage ID will stay the same. So I will run the request here and as you can see the document produced by the get coverage operation is pretty similar to the one produced by the describe coverage operation. The only difference is that now we have a range set element that contains the coverage data in a comma separated value format. The GML format that we see here is the default format in which the service returns the data. Let's make it a bit more interesting and download some satellite coverage in an image format, for example GeoTIFF. To do this, let's first change the coverage to a more exciting one, called multiband, and let's add the format parameter uh, with the value image TIFF. I will copy the URL produced here and download the image from the WCS service in the command line as the results can get uh, quite big. So let's save it in multiband.tiff. After a couple of seconds you'll see that the coverage is encoded in the tiff format and is retrieved and let's look at it. And as you can see, the image from the coverage is reproduced nicely in the TIFF format. The get coverage request type also allows us to subset parts of the coverage based on the dimensions. So let's try to do this by going back to the web interface and let's first describe the coverage multiband. So I will replace the get coverage request with a describe coverage request and remove the format parameter. Let's send the request and now I see the extent 
of the coverage here and I see that there is an easting axis and a northing axis. So now I can use these values here to do a simple subset and the format for the subset parameter is for the key we use the subset keyword and for the value we use the axis uh, followed by the minimum value, the low value of the interval and then followed by the maximum value of the interval. Let's say two, three, eight, nine, eight, nine. We can do the same on the norting axis. And again, the name of the axis and the low and high values. I will again copy it from the described coverage to make it easier. And I'll just increase it by a tiny bit here and there. Let's say that now I want here 5.9 and that's the whole request. Let's download it again in the terminal and I will issue a wget request again and save it to multiband subset.tiff. So I got it back already and now I can open it and see that I only got a small part out of it. So to subset on a given coverage, the only thing that you have to do is to add the subset key value pairs. The last thing that I would like to show to you is how to subset on a temporal axis. Let's go back to the web interface and they show a describe coverage request on the coverage called aerosol. As you can see in the describe coverage metadata, the CRS for this coverage is a compound one. The second one being a temporal CRS called ANSI date that defines the ANSI axis. The ANSI date uh, CRS measures the extents by counting the dates since an uh, datum origin. In our case, the 1st of January 1600. So this uh, coverage contains at least one temporal axis. So let's see how we can issue a get coverage request and subset on the temporal axis. The first method is to use directly the number of days specified in the described coverage. So let's be go back to the get coverage request. Change the coverage ID to aerosol here and make a smaller subset. I have the values here that I will just copy over. And the same for the norting axis. We can do it pretty simple. And let's add a new subset on the ANSI dimension axis and let's add two values in number of days for example 150,000, 103 and 150,132 for example we will do this in GML format as the result will be quite small as the subset defines a pretty small area and let's see what we get back. So as you can see, we received back a coverage with some values representing aerosol uh, quantities in the specified area. You can see here that the coverage that we subsetted has the correct uh, number of days in the extent. However, this is not a very nice way of uh, subsetting on the time axis. Most of the time you would like to actually add a human readable date here. We can do this as well. Uh, the web coverage service supports adding direct uh, dates in ANSI format on the subset, the, on the ANSI dimension. So for example, here I will subset from 2012 
on the 4th of January to 2012 on let's say the 15th of February. Let's issue the request once again and see that once again we got the coverage back. These are the numbers of number of days for uh, the chosen dates and we can see the values here. All right, and that was the plot that we wanted to show to you. So to summarize, we have seen WCS Core, which provides basic access to coverages. That means whole coverages or trimming or slicing in a get coverage request. The Domain set and the range set values, so positions and values, are guaranteed to be unchanged through these requests so that we can be sure that we obtain the original values. Format encoding can be requested optionally and you can choose a GML format style or you can choose some binary format. You can also add a GML header to a binary format so it's quite flexible in, uh, in the retrieval that we can link into other tools. That's the basic functionality of WCS Core. Tentatively kept simple. Everything else can be found in WCS extensions. And actually, we would invite you to go into the next webinar on that, the WCS extensions, to see what else we can do with the WCS. For now, thanks for bearing with us, and bye.